It's uh, with great excitement uh, that I present uh, this particular event as our first programming event of the weekend. Um, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Jeff Smith and Isaac Cates. Thanks, and, and I, I, uh, I am going to assume that you know more or less who Jeff Smith is or you wouldn't be here in the room, and that furthermore I will assume that it is not important for your purposes who I am. I I'm, I'm teach English at the University of Vermont and I also uh, publish my own comics on the side, but that's sort of not important. Um, really, I'm just here to pose a few questions to kick things off, and after I've ask Jeff a few things. Uh, I'll open the floor to questions from you and try to moderate. And at that point, my job will mostly be keeping an eye on the clock and uh, making sure that uh, we can understand what you're asking. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I will say just, a, just briefly that um, if you are not totally familiar with Jeff Smith's comics output, um, you should Get familiar with it. He, he, his uh, series Bone is obviously one of the high watermarks of um, independently published comics in, in the late 20th century and um, deserves all of the uh, fame and plaudits that it gets. I mean, it's really a, a fine, fine book and one that you can now read entirely between two covers. I uh, like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say that if, you're on, if you only know Jeff's work uh, from Bone, you owe it to yourself to check out his new work, Rassel, which is now uh, complete in one edition and in color, at, debuting at SPX. And it looks gorgeous in color. And uh, it is also some smart, weird, crazy sci-fi that is really not pitched at kids. So, and one of the things I'm sure we'll it talk about. It has boobs in it. Yeah, that's right. It has some, <laughs> there's a little bit of, you know, there's like sexy times going on in some of it. So um, I think one of the things we'll for sure talk about is making that transition into, from, from all ages work to um, more, let's say, uh, R-rated or PG-13 kind of work. Um, but I, I wanted to ask just briefly, because you, you are so well known for Bone, um, whether you have a, a kind of, whether, or whether while you were working on Bone you had a kind of philosophy of or a way of thinking about writing for kids or writing for an all ages audience. Like is there a way you thought about, I guess is there a way you thought about your audience while you were making Bone that helped you decide what could go in and what could not go in and what would shape a story and things like that? Uh, in, in in terms of like, you know, directing it at an audience, I have to say I actually didn't think about that very much at all. Um, my goal with Bone was to write an interesting story with traditional cartoon characters, but that had a, a, a very uncomics traditional uh, literary structure with a beginning and a middle and an end, mm. uh, which was very, very rare you know, in the <laughs> late 80s and early 90s. That's right. Um, and it came out of a desire when I was about nine, and I had just, for the first time, really discovered uh, Carl Barks with Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck. And even and back then, in the 60s, we didn't know his name. He hadn't actually been rediscovered by, you know, the, the comics fandom. Um, he was just a good artist, the good duck artist. And... <laughs> At the same time, I, and so like when I was a kid, I would I just loved Uncle Scrooge, and I just I just wished that I could find every issue of Uncle Scrooge that had ever been done, uh, and I was I just my fantasy was that you'd be able then to read them all in order, and they would make one giant complete story. Oh yeah, and that's kind of the origin of uh, Bone. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't like really thinking I wanted to do a comic for kids. Mm -hmm. or all ages. I just wanted to do uh, a kind of a, a smart, grown-up version of what I wanted to read when I was nine. Do you know what I mean? So, I, I, I mean, when, in 1991, when the first issue of Bone came out, there were no kids reading comics. There were no women reading comics. It was just a bunch of, you know, 30-year-old guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> so are now and, um, the 40-year-old guys who yeah. <laughs> still are the only yeah. ones reading comics that... The, the and, um, from DC or Marvel, yeah. That's exactly right. So, so I was writing for 
comics heads, for cartoon heads, uh, the, who I just figured would, would know what I was, who would get the language I was using, the homage to, to funny animals and the kind of comics, because there weren't very many of those either. And yet at the same time I had this um, desire to take that same kind of traditional cartoon character and like I said, uh, blend it with the kind of literature I've always enjoyed. Like I, 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 I'm a big Moby Dick fan, as should be no surprise. Uh, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey were big influences on me, that concept of the, of the giant epic, and of course the Lord of the Rings. So um, I just had never seen a really epic story f from start to finish ever really accomplished, at least in um, you know, Western comics. Mm -hmm. Nausicaa had been done in manga and things yeah. like that, but it was very rare in American comics. I wonder, um, have you done that sort of fantasy of assembling the Karl Barks Scrooge stories and reading them beginning to end now? And I mean, what would you, what do you think you would learn from doing that? Now? Oh well, I would learn that they, there isn't one big story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's I, but, like, but it's Don, many small stories. But Don Rosa, Don yeah. Rosa proves that I'm not the only one who was thinking about that. <laughs> he kind of made one up. He found that story. So how much did you know about the ending of? Bone when you started working on it. I mean, it, 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 it's like Nausicaa in that as you, as the reader gets farther into the story, they learn a lot more about the world that right. it's set in. And in the early chapters of Bone, it seems like a smaller world with smaller plots than it turns out to be by the time you get to the end of the book. And um, I wonder uh, how much of it how, how, how sort of, how, how far in advance did you plan or how fully was it planned when you started and how much of it were you discovering as you went? Uh, it was a little, it was a mixture of both. Uh, I wrote the ending first. So it, it was planned to be a single graphic novel from the beginning. But back then graphic novels were not um, really accepted. I mean, um, it's hard to believe this now, but when Bone first came out, graphic novels were extremely rare and kind of, um, uh, I don't know how, they were very, they were not kept in print, for one thing. Yeah. So like if a, there was a graphic novel, it might be done um, a reprint of, you know, a storyline that people really liked, and it would be put out in a, in a nice deluxe, it was considered a, de a deluxe rare Rarity, and, when you uh, say and it was graphic never kept novel, in print. You mean a, a, a sort of story that's all bound between two covers? Yeah, with a spine. Yeah. You know, just generally speaking, graphic novel is a pretty rough catch-all phrase yeah. that I'm not sure anybody from my generation really likes. But right. it's but once it's the, the librarians the once now. the librarians decided that they liked it, well, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, and that's good. That's good. So, um, but it was a, it was planned as a single book. Uh, with a literary structure from the beginning. I wrote the ending first mm. in, I have, I still have my notebook from uh, 1989 where I drew the last page and it's the same joke and everything and the bones going down the hill and so, um, uh, so and then I kind of worked backwards just like, just like you would a novel. I, you know, I mapped out a few major points along the way where you would, you know, I knew the characters were gonna have to get to this point and make some decisions. Yeah. That said, even though I had that all planned out, once then I started at the beginning and blasted through, uh, and I but I didn't have it planned out so tightly that I I didn't couldn't allow myself to explore things and have sp spontaneous events happen. I knew it was a very long story, so I knew I could and should let the characters kind of explore and take the take the story in different directions. And as long as you know, if, if it wandered off the path of my overall architecture, as long as I knew, you know, this is the signpost where they have to get back through the here. This, I just wind them, wind them back. Sometimes I get a little tricky, but uh, <laughs> uh, I yeah, was able I, to do it. One of the things that I find with, with students who have, like, if I have a, a college student who wants to do a graphic novel, they've often planned the entire plot out very tightly before they start drawing anything. And I think. I tell them, you realize that you're writing yourself almost a prison sentence. You've, you've written the entire plot out and now you're going to have to spend three years drawing the instructions from a, a version of you that is going to be three or four years older, three or four years younger than you by the time you get it done. You know, and don't you or, think or you're going to learn more? Or by 12 the time? years older. Right. <laughs> don't you think you'll, you'll be able to make better decisions by the time you get to the end? Shouldn't you leave it a little open? So well, I think, that, I think you know, it, it, it should be plenty of room. Yeah. 
to move around. But I do think you should know the ending. Uh, because it, it makes you look a lot smarter when you get there. <laughs> You're like, oh, because you you can you have somewhere for your characters to go. It yeah. gives you um, a direction. Um, but yes, though there was huge sections like the the there's a part of Bone that's probably I'm most well known for is the Great Cow Race was not in my outline. That was a, I just had a little note saying, okay, once once they all get into the valley and you meet Thorn and her mad Grandma Ben. Uh, phony bone will scam the villagers and get them all in trouble and they'll be forced to stay in the valley because up to that point the story was much smaller as you said it's just here's these three characters that you kind of recognize and they're lost and when they and they want to get home and that was a story well there was a point where I needed them to stay once they're back together they can't just leave or else I don't I can't I don't have a story so I had to I just wrote a little note phony scams the villagers and I figured I'd figure it out later yeah uh, and then I ended up with a, um, some little offhand line that Thorn threw out, like, oh, my eccentric grandma, she raises cows on foot at the spring fair. And then suddenly I got all this fan mail, all these, all these, all these letters saying, I can't wait to see the great cow race. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I thought, mm, wow, I really wasn't planning on drawing a cow race, but... I've never gotten so much mail before in all my life. Maybe there's something to this. I so, hope you like drawing cows. Yeah, I didn't know how to draw cows yet either. So, <laughs> so I figured, I well, it wasn't the great well, I started, so I started writing it in. I started thinking, well, maybe Phony's going to scam that. And I started working that kind of into the, I, and I knew I had like a few issues to go. I'd figure it out by then. Uh, and that, that just happens to be right when Bone kind of, connected with the comics community, the readers and the other cartoonists. Uh, I, I mean, all of a sudden I started seeing it written about in the Comics Buyer's Guide and even the Comics Journal in like issue number four, they said, check this book out. Uh, I was going to shows and I was hanging out with Will Eisner and uh, Joe Kubert, Frank Miller, Neil Gaiman, who was an up and coming superstar back then. Already, he was already glowing, right? And he just came up, you know, slapped me on the back and I met Dave Sim. So, which is everything I really wanted to have happen. It's like, well, I was like, this is, this is the most awesome thing in the world, except they're about to all find out that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and this cow race is gonna expose me badly. Uh, and I really started to panic like the, about the three or four issues building up to the cow race because I did not know what was gonna happen. And in desperation, um, I went way off the track of your, your question here, I apologize. But in desperation, I took one of my old animation buddies, a guy named Dan Root, I took him out to lunch. And, uh, and I said, dude, I have no idea how to scam this cow race. I have no idea what's, I don't even know what I'm doing. And we were eating, he was eating a hamburger. He didn't even look up, he goes, the mystery cow. He's, he's just eating his hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, the mystery cow, that's awesome. What's, what's the mystery cow? And he goes, that's your problem. <laughs> that's for you to figure out. And that was, so there it was right there. I, uh, it was silly and ridiculous, and I just had to just embrace how lunatic this whole concept was and go for it. Um, so I never boxed myself so much into a corner that I couldn't um, completely go off the rails. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you just have to get back on the rails. And the ending... While it didn't really change, it was 12 years and things grew. Yeah. Uh, characters that are supposed to die. Grandma Ben was in the original outline was supposed to was supposed to die, to make the sacrifice play. Um, and part of my evil plan to make everybody really feel bad about that it was so that to make you like Grandma Ben. So I spent I put tons of effort into making Grandma Ben this very likable character that the readers would be attached to. Unfortunately, I got really attached to her. Yeah. <laughs> And um, it ended up being Lucius that, that stepped, up to, stepped up to bat for that, for that fall. I don't really remember what your question was, though. No, you answered it. <laughs> for, you for sure answered it. I wanted, I, I wanted also to ask, because Rassel is so uh, different in terms of genre or in terms of the audience you might pitch it at, um, I wanted to ask, I guess I have a couple of questions that I want to ask about the the, about making that transition, or, or transition might not even be the right word, but taking up that different project. Right. I mean, I think, um, you know, having gone, having worked on Bone for so long, um, 
you must be known, you know, all over for doing work that at least librarians can call all ages work. You know, I mean, yeah. it's a book that can be put into the hands of kids and that kids really love. Right. And um, I wonder whether, like, I, I mean, I guess I want to ask you just to sort of talk about your thinking uh, about doing a book that's markedly not. Right. Something you would give to an elementary school age kid, and and also and in part like, in terms of, um, well, I guess partly in terms of like how, how like it, how deliberate that decision was in the early stages of thinking about Russell. Like, is it is it really just like well, let me do something that I can't that where I can finally do something R rated, right. or like where I can let that aspect of my personality out? Mm -hmm. And also, I'm curious about. I mean, there's also a somewhat a shift in drawing style. You know, the 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 sort of Walt Kelly-ish or Carl Barks-ish uh, uh, caricature funny animal style is pretty much completely gone from Russell, and that, that um, I mean, it obviously goes hand in hand with the transition in genre, but it must also feel different to draw. Um, I think, uh, whoops, I think I lost my, I lost the mic. Uh, it, oh, but I'm is. back, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to talk really loud, too. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I actually didn't think it was that much of a transition. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really alter my drawing style consciously. Mm. Um, with one exception, I, I, I went to a more landscape, uh, horizontal panels. Oh, I, yeah. I, I mixed up my panels to change the pacing and do a little slightly different kind of a syntax between the, the the panel to panel progression. But the but when I started thinking about Rassel was in 2000, when I got the initial idea of playing around with the idea of uh, parallel universes to like, what if you went to a parallel universe and what, you know, your life was very different and, you know, what would happen and how frustrating would that be you know, or, or wonderful, you know, what would that be like? That was the initial concept. And, um, and then immediately began to explore two things. One, real physics, like string theory, uh, which calls for parallel universes. So, because if I'm going to do science fiction, I'm one of those guys that likes it to have a nugget that's real in there, you know. I want yeah. it to have something that it's, that's solid and real. And also, um, I wanted to have kind of like hard-boiled, uh, noirish type characters in it. Those were yeah, my you, two you mentioned concepts. In some of the back matter, one of the, ra one of the um, Russell books that I looked at, uh, you mentioned Blade Runner as a mm. sort of um, genre. Uh, exactly. I was watching, I was like inking Bone in 2000, so I don't know what issue I was on, but I didn't finish Bone until 2004. And I would be 2 o'clock in the morning inking, and I'd have my laptop open, and I'd be watching Blade Runner. I really got into a run on, you know, Humphrey Bogart films, you know, The Maltese Falcon, uh -huh. The Big Sleep. Uh, and that's where, the, that's where it started to all kind of gel together. And at that time, Isaac, in 2000, Bone was not yet a children's book. <laughs> I was still drawing it for, for us As comics, guys. As yeah. yeah. I was for a bunch of cartoon heads. So it, it, there was no, you know, I wasn't writing Bone, I was writing Bone for adults. Uh, and so the, the idea that those same adults would you know, be worried about you know, swear words or something, I, I didn't even occur to me. It was just, it was just going on. So, but but uh, it took me so long to do Bone, 12 years, that I, I was able to watch as I'd go to comic conventions. As a, the same people would come back you know, year after year to get their new uh, book signed. Uh, they started bringing their girlfriends who then became their wives, and then they started bringing their children over, over a 12-year period. And somehow in there, Bone became an actual comic book for, I mean, it actually became a children's book. And, even, and then the situation got even more compounded when Scholastic right. uh, wanted to launch their imprint for children's graphic novels with Bone, and then it really is a children's book, which I have to say I have mixed feelings about. I mean, on the one hand, <laughs> I'm rich now. <laughs> Cartoonist rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> and um, the yeah, but then, but on the other hand, I I feel like the that bone does is it's forgotten that it you know 
Well, this term all ages is, is a fairly weak term. I'm not sure what it is. I just, I, all I wanted to do was do the same thing that like I was reading in the paper with Dick Tracy, or if, if you go back and you read what you know, E.C. Seeger was doing with Popeye and Thimble Theater, right. they were writing them for the kids and the adults. And I think they could be smart and sharp. And uh, I don't know what the term is for that. It's, be kind, of, it's kind of become all ages. Uh, but but yeah, you know, that's what it is. I mean, all ages is a really interesting kind of way of thinking about a readership because it, 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 I mean, it does involve leaving some things out that you might imagine putting in the book. But and I'll get, and I did struggle in I mean early on I kind of remember uh, a couple times writing and like I said I wasn't thinking it was a kids book so I if I wanted to have phone bone say oh shit I I would have done it I wasn't afraid of that I wasn't like trying to censor myself I was I made a decision at some point well Walt Kelly never had a character cuss right you know and uh, or or Schultz um, or Carl Barks, they managed to do it without it, and I actually kind of took it as a challenge to myself to get around it somehow, uh, and I didn't find that it hampered me in any way, and uh, I, I just was trying to, I, if it's good enough for Walt Kelly and Carl Barks, it's good enough for me, and that was my attitude. It's interesting that you cite, I mean, you, you're, you've been citing mostly newspaper comics uh, authors as influences, though, I mean, they are, those, the newspaper strips are definitely, they, they are kind of I don't, I'm not trying to argue, oh, well, of course they're censored in some way. They just, uh, you, your sense of your audience is different if you're putting it in a newspaper. And to tell you the truth, the comics, like newsstand comics that you or I would have grown up reading, also were all the time thinking, well, this could fall into the hands of an eight-year-old or a five-year-old. Right. And so, you know, I don't need to have the characters swear. Why should I have them do this or that? And I think actually... Um, now we wind up branding a lot of comics as all ages because we know there are comics out there that aren't for kids, but it almost feels like those are the, those would be the ones that should have their special name in a way. You know, yeah. like, well, like these, uh, these, well, these I'm, are the dirty comics. Or I'm partially like to blame for the whole all ages label because um, there was a moment in the early '90s when Bone was catching on and it was being discussed a lot. Um, and there was a, an effort, I mean, it just started to get called a children's comic. And I, I could not let that stand. I had right. to push back against that because if I got labeled a children's comic, not because I was offended by it, but if I was labeled a children's comic in comic books direct market distribution system in 1993, my sales would have evaporated because there were no children. I had to be viewed as a, I just wanted to be a, a humor book. You know, and I had to keep it. And I finally, once I started using the term all ages, I found that the, the press uh, began to pick that up. And at least, at least that didn't cut off my adult readership, which was my only readership at the time. So, yeah. But now I'm, I'm not pleased with that title. I don't think it's, um, it's not a real title that exists in the book world categories or anything like that. It's yeah, you don't see To Kill a Mockingbird branded as... All ages. Well, look, at, look, it's all just is an all ages book. Yeah, it's it's just all marketing. Just <laughs> as long as you don't stop me from doing it, call me, call it whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> well, do you? Um, I mean, do, do you feel like uh, uh, some of the way that Rassel turned out is a? Uh, oh, sorry, I was just waving to somebody. Oh, okay, that's cool. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't like a question or something that I was no. missing because I realized that I had like ninety degrees of people yeah, there yeah. that I wasn't seeing. Um, and they're, might, they're good looking people too, aren't they? <laughs> and happy. Happy, good looking people. Uh, um, comics. Do you guys like comics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, know. I got in the elevator this morning to go down and get some coffee, and the, 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 it was just jam packed every floor, you know, more people coming in carrying all their boxes. And some guy in the back says, Hey, do you like comics? Obviously, everyone in that, including him, they were all, we're all us, right? Going to comic, all the comics. And uh, we're all laughing, and somebody says, no, we're, we're going to the hot tub show down the road. <laughs> Which wasn't true. I, it was, but it was, I, I mean, just the attitude at this show is so awesome. I love it. Um, I wanted to ask some stuff, some, a little bit more about Rassel and uh, I guess about setting. And okay. um, you, you'd said that you tended to, you, you tend in this book toward these sort of landscape oriented panels in order to give more of the world, I guess, mm -hmm. right, around the characters. And also because I, I think maybe it's appropriate because the setting is the desert southwest and it is a very horizontal 
setting. Like mm -hmm. if you're there looking around, you you see a very wide horizon. Exactly. Um, and I wonder, like, I, the plot of Rassel could happen in, in any part of the country, but it seems like it. There's something about the flavor of it that requires the desert, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about why the desert Southwest for this book. Uh, it it was just a way to um, explore the noir qualities of the story. Oh. Um, the uh, original noir, you know, Dashiell Hammett's Maltese Falcon, all that those stories all took place in San Francisco, and they were kind of about the city, you know, and the maze of the city. Uh, and I, I think noir, when it's boiled down to its finest, it's just it's it's man against himself. It's a very primitive situation, uh, and the maze element in Rassel is his is the parallel universes. So you know, he's he's created a, a web of messes with bad decisions, <laughs> and that's the maze. But then I wanted to then just throw him into the desert where you, um, where it's, you, you can't, you're stripped of all artifice. It's just really man against himself, symbolically. So um, that's why so I So the, the that's emptiness why of the it. desert is really important. Yes, very much. In fact, writing it, when I, I was trying to get the final you know, bits of the story together, and it was just not quite there yet, I went and spent two weeks in the Sonoran Desert, uh, and it is unbelievably quiet there. I mean, there's, I mean, the only thing you hear is like the wind whistling through uh, the Suharo cactuses, the giant cactuses, which are so iconic in our, you know, in all our subconsciouses. Uh, and every, you just sometimes hear insects, or occasionally like a one bird would fly over, and it's just like everything inside you just has nothing to hold it in. It just goes out. And uh, I had a really, really good uh, kind of like a, I don't know, I wish I'd have had peyote, but I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just had to do it with my comic book imagination. And, and I did, and, I, uh, and all of a sudden, the missing parts of Rassel just kind of all fell into place. Uh, and again, I was able to write the ending first. I, I believe you do have to write the ending first. I don't, I agree with you, you don't want to have every panel planned out. because. Uh, the work needs to be spontaneous. And I want to say one more thing about my art style. Yes, it's a different book. It's a, about a different kind of um, story. Bone was about innocence under attack, and Rassel is more about damaged people. Yeah. And they were very different experiences for me to write, like Bone, and probably to read as well. Bone's very open and innocent and uh, fresh and uh, about the world, whereas Russell was the opposite. It was very constricting and it was claustrophobic to write. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was different, but I, at the same time, I, am, I didn't feel like it was such a giant change. I think someone who reads Russell will recognize my artwork. You know, yeah. You'll know it's me. You'll recognize the way I do movement and action without words. I mean, it's, it's it, like I, that the term, you know, the, the syntax of my panel-to-panel -panel progression is exactly the same. I would think people would recognize it. Yeah, I think that they feel like they're, I mean, they, they, they feel like they're written and drawn by the same person, but I think that, the, I mean, the major difference would probably be for people marketing the books rather than for, right. for uh, somebody reading them who's, who's sort of interested in getting a sense of your, your personal style or your personal preoccupations or whatever. I mean, right. the, these, you know, but I, I like what you were saying about the way that Russell starts to feel more closed in and claustrophobic and even sort of like that snake eating its own tail in a way. Yeah. By the time you get to the end, it really does kind of tighten up yeah. in a way that the experience of reading Bone is about kind of discovery and opening up and mm -hmm. the world getting bigger. And Yeah. Well, I'm in a different stage of my life, too. I mean, <laughs> when I was writing Bone, the world was wide open, you know? And, uh, I'm getting older now and making bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> you realize bad decisions can make good stories. Yeah, yeah or the good stories are about. Or they're more interesting to me yeah. now to see to see people, you know, make decisions and, and live by the consequences. And do you um, and bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> bourbon also figures just, in. There's this, a lot of bourbon in Rassel. Then there's a lot of bourbon in me during Rassel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, you know, I, I, uh, I, there, there was, there's a sort of cluster of, um, I don't know what, they're almost like totemic objects that are in mm. the book. Like there's the Clark bar, there's this 
Uh, there's Blonde on Blonde, but it's like the Blonde on Blonde that's by Robert Zimmerman and not by Bob Dylan. Right. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, I guess, um, the, the image of the maze and these other southwestern Indian images. Mm. And um, those are kind of poised against images of, for example, the art that Russell is stealing, the Picasso, for example, that you see occasionally in the book. And, and I wonder whether you had a sense of creating, a, like, I mean, Russell feels like, and it's, it, I mean, in the same way that it feels like it needs to be in the desert southwest, it feels like it needs to be a, uh, an, it, it's an American book. Yeah. It has a, a real Americanness to it. And I, um, I wonder if you want to say anything about that, about like, about it being, I mean, anchored not in the real world, obviously, but in, in a world that feels like our world or is yeah. connected to ours? Well, it, it, I, I had that pointed out to me. I was, I was being interviewed in Copenhagen uh, about three years ago. And I was talking, just my usual talk about um, Huckleberry Finn and Moby Dick and um, Karl Barks and the, all the same things I've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. And he just stopped me and says, you're really American. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I didn't. I don't consciously. I, I, I don't. I didn't mean to do that. And in fact, um, the real catalyst for Bone was the moment I, I first saw Heavy Metal magazine. It was a summer before my senior year in high school. It was 1977, and Heavy. Well, it was actually this, that was the first year summer I read Lord of the Rings. Star Wars came out. And heavy metal appeared on the newsstands in America oh, for the first time, and um, and I was smoking some stuff, and <laughs> and it was a and it was a wonderful it was it was a mind blowing summer. Uh, and heavy metal back then, if you're old enough to remember, was a very different magazine. It was not the kind of the soft core porn thing that it's kind of become. It was uh, Mobius and Drillet and um, all these brilliant French. Uh, fantasy artists who were off the hook, and I had never seen anything like that. So it was it was like grown up fantasy stuff, and that was actually so I have, I started like pushing that. So it wasn't all American. It was like it was take I wanted to take American cartoon characters and throw them into this crazy stew of European grown up fantasy comics, and that's kind of where that's really what Bone came from. Um, I had one other thing to ask you about Rassel, and then I should probably take a couple questions from yeah, the audience. Sure. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, as I was looking through, there, there's a, one really uh, iconic is maybe not quite the right word, but one image that really sticks with me of of Rassel sort of armed with his uh, you know his transport engines and wearing that mm. uh, that southwestern mask and kind of hunched over that occurs several times. Yeah. And is very, I mean, it's very distinctive and also very dreamlike or strange. Yeah. And I, I wondered, like, how much of something like Rassel comes to you visually when you're thinking about it initially, and how much of it comes to you in terms of a plot with, you know, here's some actions and some consequences and characters and sort of, in other words, a, a story planned out instead yeah. of individual images that that stick with you and that motivate a story? Uh, it's, I, it's, it's, a, it's both. I mean, it's a, we have a very, it's a very visual medium, unquestionably, and yet it, it's, it, it's totally workable with literary structure. So it's, it's both, uh, and something like Russell's costume, um, it, that was completely just for impact, for graphic impact. Because I did uh, talk to like physicists and kind of like get my, get my story straight on what could possibly be really in Nikola Tesla's lost notebooks, which I didn't make up. There's really papers of his that disappeared after his death. Um, but I wanted to tie them into string theory and I had to come up with stuff that would be believable. So I'm showing stuff and talking to physicists. Um, and, the only th and they loved all my, all my concepts of parallel. They thought all that was totally, Believable, not real, but it could be. The only thing they disagreed with was my giant, these giant engines, these warp engines that he carries on his shoulder to magnetically, because they were like, that's ridiculous. We could totally do that with something this big. <laughs> 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 they wouldn't, they wouldn't, and I, you know, he's got like these big giant like metal jet engines with like rivets in it, you know, like he, like he built it out in his garage or something. Um, and then why he stuck uh, some, you know, 
ancient uh, ritual mask on, I, I can't explain that either. Again, it was just, I wanted impact. And, and there, was a, there was a play, there was something playful in the piece about um, making something that's so clearly the most high-tech scientific thing ever invented look, you know, like a, like a or like almost a religious or a voodoo doll thing, or yeah, or like you know. a weird little kachina figure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In, f in fact, I wish I had used a kachina mask instead. When I originally designed them, I used a mask out of, um, I think it was Rwanda, um, and I, and then later everything became so uh, hopey, and, uh, but nobody's really noticed. So <laughs> <laughs> don't anybody tell. So we have time to take maybe two or three questions from the audience. Um, let me get first this extremely eager young lady. How did you come up with the idea for Bone? How did I come up with the idea for Bone? I was, how old are you, can I ask? How old are you? Um, ten. Ten. When I was about your age, I loved comics. I read Peanuts in the paper. I used to watch Bugs Bunny on TV. Um, in fact, I still watch cartoons. Like Adventure Time is like, I'm totally hooked on that. <laughs> that is the, in fact, that's the first really surreal thing I've seen since Bone that really floats my boat. I mean, it's that kind of, what is this guy doing? <laughs> <laughs> But I loved cartoon characters, and I used to try to make up my own. Uh, and I was probably maybe I was probably closer to six or seven when I started drawing Phone Bone and his other characters, uh, and and writing my own little stories. So I, I I just they just came out of the characters originally. I had I had these little characters and these drawings, and I had to give them something to do. So I gave them a little little adventures, and I made up other bones for him to talk to. And that's where the three characters I have drawings from when I was like ten your age, um, they're little, little booklets that I wrote little stories of the three bone characters, Phony and Phone Bone and Smiley, and they're, you could recognize them. I mean, they're not drawn very well, but their personalities are there. Phony's, you know, greedy and selfish and bosses everybody around. I mean, they're, they're, you would recognize them. So that's, they just kind of came out of my childhood love of, of cartoons. Uh, let's see, let me, uh you here in front of the column? Yeah, I was just curious what kind of pen you use to ink um, materials in general, and do you ever do anything digitally, like with a tablet? Uh, what do I do? I, what kind of pen do I use, or and do I do anything digitally? Yeah, I um, uh, no, I don't use. Well, let me back up. Uh, I'm I like I have I work on two ply Bristol with a blue pencil and a paintbrush. I dip ink. So everything's done with a, with a paintbrush, and I do it with one paintbrush. All the lines can be, I, do, I use a um, Winsor Newton uh, sable hair, which is like a horse hair, like a paintbrush, a uh, watercolor brush. Um, and I use a, it's size number one. And with that one brush, I can get you know, lines that thick or down, twirl it down to like one hair and get that really fine, tiny stuff for the backgrounds or the details. Um, and one brush last me, would last me about like two issues, and then it was trashed, you know, had hairs hanging out all over the place, and it was split. Um, and digitally, uh, most of the digital work I do is in terms of like color, or um, I've begun to like figure out how to like draw, you know, a, a background, I mean, figure out a, all the background angles in a scene so that I could just draw all the, kind of unimportant and boring corners or backgrounds, just draw them two or three times, and then I can use, digitally, I can, with Photoshop, I can place them behind the characters um, and, and move them around. So it um, saves me a lot of time, and I actually get the comic book done. And as long as the story, as long as the reader's eye doesn't stop on, on a repeated background or something like that, I feel like it, it, it works and keeps the story moving. Um. There in the in the black, Me? yeah. All right. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little about like how you were planning to do a continuation of the Bone series. I I, I was in uh, I forget what show I was at. Uh, oh, I was in San Diego at the Comic Con. I I did say I have I have some new Bone projects going on, and that got interpreted as I'm you know new Bone comics. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Um, 
I, I, I probably will. I'm pretty sure I'll never do a sequel to Bone. I, I just don't have any interest in going back to the world. That said, I love the three cousins, and I love to draw them. I love to think up excuses for them. So I have a couple of projects in works in the works with Scholastic um, that will be the Bone Cousins, but it won't be back in the world, and it won't be like a, a new story like that. So uh, I can't really say any more than that about it, but. Um, it will let me draw the cousins again and have an excuse for it, so that'll be fun. Do you have Do you have inklings of other things that are next on your plate? I mean, are there other uh, yeah? I, I, other in fact, I've actually you can give us yes. I actually have started a new comic, and I I haven't show, I, I I showed one image of this uh, uh, in WonderCon, and I kind of kept it un, under wraps since then. Uh, it's going to be uh, about take place about two million years ago. It's going to feature uh, a Homo erectus character, uh, an early human. Uh, Two million years ago, uh, there was like the very first fantastic ice age, uh, and Africa w w was in a drought because all the moisture of the planet was sucked up in these ice caps. So all the, all the animals, all the early hominids, all the apes, all the creatures that were alive in Africa were all going extinct because their, their jungles were disappearing. And it was at that time that the very first early human left Africa. Somebody was the first guy, and this is, I'm gonna tell his story. And it, I think it'll be um, halfway between Rassel and Bone. It's gonna be much more like Bone than, uh, than Rassel. It's gonna have humor, because uh, part of the story is uh, everybody's trying to stop him from doing it. That all the ancient gods, the animals, the other humans, they're all gonna try to stop him from leaving Africa. Uh, and it, it, should be, it should be pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Sounds really cool. And that's going to start, I'm actually going to do it as a web comic. It'll be free. Uh, it'll start, I'm going to think probably sometime around Thanksgiving. Uh, and we'll do it in seasons. So like you'll get like the equivalent of an issue, like 25 pages at a time. And again, I, I created a new panel flow for myself. I've, I'm doing the pages horizontally so that they'll fit the size of a computer screen. Oh, nice. uh, which means when I print it as a book at the end, it'll... It'll be awkward, but. <laughs> but you can make a book that's lengthy. Yeah, Boneville.com. Come around Thanksgiving and, and check it out. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, I'll take, uh, well, one or two if the first one is short. But uh, over here. Um, well, Bartleby the Rat Creature Cub was named by someone who wrote in a letter. Um, I, we had a contest, actually. Uh, that's not really what you were asking. It was, um, I, as I said earlier, I, Bone was planned to be a graphic novel from the beginning. And I planned to use the, the, the serialization of Bone as a dry run, basically. But it was, I look at, even with Rassel or with Bone, the comic books themselves were like the opening night of a play. I got notes, and I could, and I had a very good relationship with my readers, uh, and I would talk to them at shows, and they would send me letters because back in the early '90s, they still had the letters page. Now it's mostly on Facebook and on blog and stuff. But uh, I had an, I, w I wanted to know if people understood what I was trying to get at, and sometimes people would miss what I was saying completely. And I would understand that what I needed, I didn't do it right or good enough. So when I got, when I make the little graphic novels, like in 93 when I started collecting them, um, I would go back and I would change some things, I would add pages or I, I might fix things. So, um, so I was always, I was very open to what people thought. Because also if people thought something was going to happen, it might be funny to like do the opposite. Um, <laughs> I just had certain points that in order to get to the ending, they had to have, get there. And as long as I you know, played around and I got through that little opening, um, like at Rock Jaw, the big mountain lion, was, and, and the little, little Return the Rat Creature Cub, that was a story point I really knew was gonna happen. And I had a lot of crazy things happen before that, but eventually I got them up into the mountain, they met Rock Jaw, and that was, so that was kind of how I, does it, is that good enough? Good enough, all right, good. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I can do one more, but we'll have to, I mean, you know, we have to wrap up so the next thing can come in. So uh, who has a totally cool question? Let's see. You know, it's, <laughs> you know uh, John, John Lewis is coming in next, I think. And uh, so you just stay here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or you can come up and spend money in the, uh, spend all your money, you know. <laughs> well, and I'm doing you're, a signing, signing at the at, booth when? At, do you know? Two o'clock? I don't remember. There two, was a sign on, on the booth. Two? Okay, yeah. good. I'm glad you guys know. <laughs> Um, let me say, uh, here, you, you on the aisle in green. Uh, the additions of bone, uh, they're originally in, you know, black and white, and then the scholastic additions were colored, and then you have the bound edition of brass that was in color now. Um, how do you feel, what's aesthetically like, is there an improvement, or is there a fundamental change, and then also, is there ever going to be a large format black and white bound edition of bone? Uh, actually, the Bone One Volume Edition, the paperback, is black and white, and that's actually still published by my wife and I. Vijay and I still self-publish the One Volume Edition. Um, Scholastic publishes the nine volumes. I originally self-published the nine volumes in black and white, but when Scholastic took over, they colored them. And the way I feel about the color, I, I'll tell a quick story. I'll try to make this quick, and I've told it before. So. Um, Basically, when Scholastic contacted me, Art Spiegelman was their consultant to, to launch this line for this graphics for kids. And he called me, and he's the one who thought it should be in color. And I'll shorten this story, because I didn't want it to be in color. I liked black and white. I worked really hard to make it look good in black and white. And Art Spiegelman's book, Mouse, was a huge uh, creative touchstone for me in my life to make me want to get into to do the graphic novels. So I said to Art, because he wouldn't let it go. He, I mean, over a course of like a year, he kept cornering me at comic book shows and saying, you gotta do it in color, you gotta do it in color. And I said, Art, what? look, Mouse is in color. Why shouldn't Bone be in color? And his answer was, well, Mouse is about war. It's about the Holocaust. It should be in black and white. But Bone is about life, and it won't be finished until it's in color. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And, and I still publish the black and white because that's how I always wanted it, that's my baby, but I gotta admit the color work, works really well. Kids love it in color. And Rassel, we wouldn't color it until we found the right palette, and Steve Hammaker and I worked incredibly hard for over a year, testing and testing and testing until we found a palette that was Save rich. <laughs> Which was rich and dark and smoky and actually pushed the, the comic further. Because my original plan was again to bind it into one big black and white and then maybe do color. But as soon as we found this palette, I was like, that's it. This actually is, so I love this, uh, this color. This is, this is the version of Rassel. All right, thank you all so much for coming. It was a lot of fun. Isaac, thank you. Appreciate that.